the power of aspiration. What were some of the ways that you developed this aspiration, this interest, this urge? I think it's super helpful to, in Buddhism, that we don't jump right in. That has been very helpful. Yep. I have a very slow beginning. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, steady and sustainable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes? Uh, I wonder, uh, have I understood it right that aspiration sort of is linked to motivation? But, uh, yes. Yeah, shorter. yeah, aspiration is linked to motivation. In the shorter. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it's almost like uh, aspiration becomes what you do with your motivation. So you have this big motivation, then what do you do because of it? Yeah, you aspire to what? And, uh, and that sort of gathering of energy and momentum, that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, tell me, tell me more about aspiration. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yeah. I think it's very nice that it, that it takes time. Mm. Uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it takes time. People outside can see me here. They're asking, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I think that's very interesting. Very good to think about. Yeah. And what do you think about this idea of not starting until you know you can finish? Yeah, small, small projects, right? You know, we are starting the process of enlightenment already. We're not going to wait until we can be finished in order to start. We're gathering the momentum now. But that general idea of giving up in the middle of a task really, really tires you out. Yeah, if you start something and drop it, and start something and drop it, that, that really ruins your momentum. Better not to start. Better to wait and gather your energy and then start. What do you think about that idea? Do you have objections, or do you feel like that rings true in your life? Could it be that um, yes, we've contemplated quite strongly our mission, so to speak, but on that path of our mission, there are going to be some tumultuous mm. where we need to contemplate further or yeah. see, sit with them a little bit more before we can carry out the next phase. Phase two. Yeah, reassess. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, um, for me, I think the finish line is that clear. Yeah. I've got a, a big vision. Yeah. But it might not come to fruition for, I don't know, hundreds of years. Yep. Yeah, it's true. Truly, but, yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that that is quite a true point, you know, that even if you... Um, have a plan, sometimes you have to reassess, was that a plan to keep, and yeah. is it a bad thing to stop if it turns out yeah. that was a bad idea? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes you do have to stop. Um, but it's, the, it's kind of overcoming that habit of not having prepared properly, kind of starting half prepared and then stopping halfway through. The way that that really pulls momentum. Yeah. You know that particular one that can happen? Mm -hmm. You hadn't prepared fully, you hadn't aspired thoroughly, you just kind of raced into it and then um, ran out of gas mm -hmm. or um, ran out of reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, other thoughts about aspiration or questions about it? I just think what you're saying now, um, in, in, in the context of, of um, uh, meditation and Buddhism, I, I understand that, but I also have like a, a question box on in my mind. Sometimes you try and test things just to know. If yeah. It's you. So sometimes yeah. you just do something in the spontaneous and just looking for things. Like, yeah. Know, be, have, yeah. There, Testing. Yeah. Like Testing. you know, you're curious. Maybe yeah. qigong is a good idea. Yeah. Let's go to one class. Then you go to one class and say, "Oh, it's nice, but it's not for me." And then you try something else. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Um, I think it's again and again about what your motivation is. And sometimes what we call spontaneity is escaping our current reality. Yeah there's an opportunity to run from what's happening and we're like yes yes that let's try that you know um there there can be a lot more power in thinking about things before you start them 
So it could be that you're thinking, I would like a physical exercise that is spiritually motivated and has um, more than just becoming toned and fit. It has something to do with my subtle energy system. Maybe it will help me learn to meditate better so I'm not so achy. I would like to try something like that. So then you try Qigong and realize, oh, it's not for you. Or, and then you try yoga and then you try this and eventually you find the right format. But you had a plan rather than, I'm just going to take this class because I hate my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so then it's, you know, going with that power of aspiration where you had an overlying agenda that was thought out and then you're experimenting with what's the method that's going to bring that about. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like this. Yeah. And then this power of steadfastness, this confidence that says, by myself alone, what do you think about this? How do you develop this steadfastness? Hmm? I think it's, it's uh, brilliant because it's, uh, it's really, you don't need recognition. Yeah, you don't need recognition. And uh, you stay on your path. Yep. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, not, it's enough just to know your path is worthwhile. You don't need observation or validation. There's one mind training slogan of Geshe Chakawa that's really, um, it's funny, it's interesting. It says, don't expect applause. <laughs> don't expect applause. So if you do a good thing, you're not expecting everyone to go, yay! <laughs> right? Don't expect applause. <laughs> it's uh, interesting because it's true. <laughs> Part of us kind of wants everyone to say, yay! <laughs> but it was enough that it was a good idea to, make, to be sort of fulfilling and sustainable. Yeah, if you start from that place. You know, if you start from, I'm going to need some recognition for this to be worth my time then that's a whole other issue, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, what else came up for you with this power of steadfastness or this positive pride or this confidence? Um, how do you develop it? How else? Patience? Yeah. Yeah. Patience is a huge piece, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for both yourself and others. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, clarity of vision, confidence in your vision, patience with it. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it's, it's easy to get tangled in, in, into doing things, not realizing why doing them. Yep. Especially in close relationship with friends or yeah. family. Yeah, why am I doing this? Yeah. yeah. It's because it's so easy, the close relationship, it's so easy that we affect. Much, much more than yeah, we really do. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, it's interesting if you sometimes travel by yourself and you, you're like, who am I without the people I'm used to? Mm -hmm. You know, who is this one actually unrelated to the people observing me a certain way or I'm used to interacting a certain way? It's, an in it's always interesting, isn't it, to see if you're influenced by only strangers, are you a different person? Or if no one is watching you, are you a different person? Um, what changes in your priorities or your way of being? It's, it's interesting to see. And um, I think you're right that this confidence really relies on self-awareness. Yeah, knowing yourself. Yeah. And uh, yeah, checking, what is my motivation? What is my motivation? What is my motivation? It can't be said enough because sometimes we don't really know our motivation. Yeah, and you don't, sometimes you don't know your motivation, and so you just kind of sit with, why wouldn't I do this? Why did I decide to do this? And you're just kind of sitting with it, and maybe you don't even remember why you started. So you ask, is it still of benefit to my big picture motivation, which is the one I want to start from, or at least come back to? You know, so even if you're not sure why you started to kind of stop and check is it fulfilling a purpose and now readjust so it's coming from the right motivation? Change your motivation. Um, yeah. 
can you change your motivation and also lie to yourself about that? <laughs> I'm not doing it for this reason, I'm doing it for that reason. La 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 la. This is for all sentient beings. And they're like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. So you have to be careful too that you're not saying, I'm doing this in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings when in fact your motivation is different. Yeah, so you have that little part of your mind watching yourself, checking checking for self-deception with kindness, you know, not a mean watcher, a kind watcher, a humorous watcher, yeah, that notices when you lie to yourself it's funny and you can change rather than you're bad, yeah. Yeah, so any, in, any other bits about steadfastness or questions about that? It's just this unwavering attitude, I will work for the welfare of all sentient beings. All sentient beings includes you. You're not leaving yourself out of that. But it's just, you know, solid determination. And then sometimes you know what that would look like in terms of your daily life, and sometimes you have to think about it. But your underlying drive is just keep coming back to that. Yeah. Ah, so um, we're going to do the last two now. So the third one is um, the power of joy or the force of joy. Um, so being happy in the middle or at the beginning, middle, and end of a positive activity in the same way children are when they're playing. Yeah, and the reason this example is used, and this example is used in the traditional text itself, is that when children are playing, they are using effort. There is effort, right? Especially if they're doing like sports or tag or they're running around, but they are just happy, right? You know, when they're just hee 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 hee, running, 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 <laughs> right? Um, or um, little kids when they're playing quietly, like if they're playing around a house or with like little figures and they're having little social interactions, there's so much focus, right? Have you ever seen little kids when they're playing like that? There's effort involved, they're really concentrating. What are the rules of this game that we're creating right now? What is the um, make-believe that we're creating? What is the story here? What are people saying to each other? Um, you know, or what are these car is going to do or how are we going to build this bridge you know there's negotiations and there's thought and there's conversation um, there's effort is the point there is effort but it's happy effort and if you say to them darling it's time to go to bed they say no <laughs> right because even though they're tired they want to keep going yeah, so we're trying to get this kind of joy that even when we're tired, we want to keep going, but the discipline that says, but because I'm tired, I'm going to stop. So we stop before the joy runs out. Normally, we stop when the joy runs out. We want to stop before the joy runs out because then you want to keep doing it. Do you understand, right? So we usually wait until it's not fun anymore and then collapse in a heap. Yeah, whatever it is. Children, you know, you, you notice when you interrupt them, they're mad. When we interrupt ourselves when we're on a roll, it can feel kind of strange, like I've still got some energy left to finish this thing, I should keep going. But that is one of the um, easiest ways into burnout, when you get burnt out in a job that you actually like. Right? There, we get burnt out with jobs we don't like all the time for lots of reasons that are quite obvious. But sometimes you burn yourself out doing what you love. right? And it's because you get this kind of momentum and you're doing well, but then it kind of gets a little bit tied up with some attachment. Yeah? And that drive that was just a nice steady pace at some point kind of got a little bit of a frenzy to it. And you're starting to exhaust yourself. Yeah, and you've still got a little bit more energy, so you keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. But if you keep doing that, you will lose the joy of the thing. Yeah, so, so pacing yourself takes actually quite a bit of discipline, just the way it takes discipline to tell kids it's time to go to bed even though you're having fun. We're still a little bit the same way. We're like, it's time to stop this job even though you still have some energy left. Stop before you're exhausted. Because what happens when children don't stop playing until they're exhausted? They get angry and they have a tantrum. Yeah? You know when you just let them go as long as they can and they've pushed it too far and now they're overtired? And when kids get overtired, even though they had a really nice day, they get angry, right? And they throw things and they have a tantrum and you're like, you had a nice day, what's wrong with you? Yeah? 
hello, <laughs> weird creature, right? But they're just, they're tired, right? And that's what happens when we get tired, is we get angry. Our version of that is we get depressed or tight. Yeah? So, so just noticing the way we kill the joy by trying to squeeze the, every last drop out of it today rather than letting it kind of regrow and starting again and continuing again in that way. So the power of relinquishment goes with the power of joy very much so. This power of relinquishment is resting at the right time. Yeah. So you get joy by resting at the right time. And you want to stop the good activity that you're doing very consciously while you're still happy with it. Yeah. And then the rest becomes the sort of rest that you're enjoying the rest. You, you know, it's an important thing to rest, but you're not falling into rest as its own sort of entertainment or activity. Yeah. Do you know when you push it too far and you sleep, then bed is so nice. Yeah, and the next morning you wake up, and when you wake up, you think, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> Means you pushed it too far the day before. If you wake up thinking, no, I don't want to, <laughs> right? It's because you got into that trend of pushing too far. And it also means the rest couldn't rejuvenate you. And this is this thing with rest too, is that sometimes when we stop our activity, our beneficial activity, we go into what we kind of call wind down mode or relaxation mode, which is actually entertainment which is fine in a certain context, but when you actually need to relax, when you need to stop, you have to relax and stop. If you entertain yourself instead, you're just stimulating. Yeah, there's a lot of stimuli, which then needs to be processed. Even if it's something totally healthy and above board that you're watching or reading or looking at, or a conversation that's very healthy, if you're doing that during the time when you actually need to be resting, your rest won't be as restful. And you will wake up with that. Maybe you're happy enough to wake up, but part of you is dragging. Do you know what I mean? So we actually have a lot less capability for amount of work in the day than we think. You know, you say, okay, I've got these 12 hours or whatever it is to work, but really of those hours, how many can you be intensely concentrated on work? And then how many of those can you then be intensely concentrated in family dynamics, uh, fun, uh, hobbies, stuff like that? And to be very honest, that those things are good and are a relief of one type of stress, but actually cause a little bit of another kind of stress, especially because there's usually attachment associated with them. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we tell ourselves lies about entertainment. Like we think, I just need to do this for 10 minutes and then I'll be fine and move on to rest. But after 10 minutes of whatever the entertainment thing is, you need 10 more minutes and 10 more minutes and 10 more minutes because craving has been engaged. Yeah? Like um, if you haven't eaten anything sweet today, you might not particularly need sweet, but if you had a tiny bit of sweet, suddenly you need a whole sweet. <laughs> yes? This is what happens when you engage your craving. And so this is a recognition of the power of external conditions based on your habits because some conditions affect some people differently. And we're not blaming conditions, but you're understanding your conditions. So if you know that if you have a discussion with your partner after work about how the day went, it could either be soothing and help you process, or it could uh, reawaken all the agitation of that day. It could go either way, right? It's not processing your day with your partner in and of itself is stressful or stress relieving. You have to ask yourself, when I do it, what does it do? Yeah? And then based on that, when will I place that during the day or do I need to do it? Yeah, so we're just checking that the labels we call our little activities are actually accurate labels. Is it making sense? Right, can you think of an example of when you've mislabeled something? You've called it relaxation when it was actually entertainment, or called something winding down, but it actually wound you up? 
ever, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, what's an example? I will, oh, this is going to be so relaxing. Yes. <laughs> Watching and a series. Is, yeah. But I still keep believing it for real. Yeah, every time, right? <laughs> this will be the one. <laughs> yeah, this will be the magic series that really relaxes me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well coming to the realization after a long time that um, things that you didn't like me, you like them because of the effect that you want to realize them. Um, Yeah. Um, you realize how, how that can affect you, so if it affects you, uh, it, it takes a lot out of you. you, 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 you know, I've labeled it duty. Because yeah. Then, you know, it, it, because that's how it feels to me, and then I'm more prepared for it. Yeah. And sometimes it embarrasses us to label it what it is, but it's more helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is interesting, and it's also sometimes uh, makes us ashamed or embarrassed if you call something what it is, if you call it entertainment and not relaxation. It's tricky, like we're allowed to relax after work, but we're not allowed to get entertained after work, <laughs> so we call it relaxation, you know. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is, you know, entertainment in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but, but it's that thing of if it triggers your attachment, it will never be enough. You will never be satisfied. It wouldn't be a problem if you were satisfied with it, but when attachment or craving is triggered, do you ever feel the way you hope to feel before you start? Like with a series, you know? And it could be that there is enjoyment during that process, there's interest during that process, but it doesn't equal feeling at ease and soothed and happy afterwards. Yeah, I, I was thinking about when, when it is in entertainment and not resting, you mm. usually get late to the next. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes you, it makes you late, yeah. absolutely. And when you get hooked into attachment, how do you react to people interrupting you? Yeah, and that's a very good way of noticing if what you're doing is attachment or not attachment. Mm -hmm. If you get interrupted, how do you react? So if you're in an attachment headspace with whatever you're doing, you know, it could be something seemingly virtuous like cleaning the house, but if you've got an attachment with it and you're interrupted, if you get angry, that's how you know it was attachment. Mm -hmm. Yeah? If you just go, oh, the phone's ringing and it's no big deal, then attachment maybe didn't co-opt your activity. But do you know that feeling of when you're in something, you've gotten sort of tunnel vision with it and someone interrupts you, you're like, what? Yeah? Um, you know, you could take the example of like watching a series on Netflix or something. If you're not too attached and your partner goes, hey, what are you watching? You'll go, oh, I'm watching the show, come watch it with me. And you can like bond and have couple time. But if you're in super attachment, you'll be like, piss off, watch your own. <laughs> right? Because right? you're like in it. Yeah? You know this one? Right? So <laughs> it's a good litmus test, right? Are you willing to share? Yeah, if you're not willing to share this experience that you're engaged in, you've probably, craving has taken over. Yeah, I mean, it's true with conversations, right? If you're having a very attached conversation with one other person and a third party comes, even someone you both like, you kind of give them the freeze out vibe, like, not now, mm -mm, mm -mm. right? because you're having a thing, yeah? You've gotten into an attachment thing. It doesn't have to be a sexual thing or a flirting thing, but you've gotten into an attachment thing, which is by nature excluding. And that, that it's funny because before it's challenged, it feels like pleasure, it feels like intimacy, it feels like closeness with the activity, the object, or the person. It feels so lovely, but you don't realize it's getting toxic until someone interrupts. And then you realize how exclusive you're getting and how tunnel vision you're getting. And if no one interrupts you, you also have that feeling when it ends. Yeah, when the conversation ends, you kind of have a let down sad feeling. Or when the series ends <laughs> and you're kind of in that, oh, which one shall I watch now? 
oh, didn't do what I wanted, and now it's midnight, and my eyes hurt. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know that the letdown. So even if you're not interrupted, just when the thing finishes, you have a sadness. Yeah. So attachment is a recipe for anger or depression. Yeah. Even if it's short-lived and not that big a deal, realize it has an energetic cost. It's one more thing that wears you out. Yeah, um, Having that open mind that's kind of willing to share, willing to collaborate, willing to be interrupted, seems like more work because it is more work in the beginning, but once you're in it, it's actually a lot more in the flow. Yeah, it's so much nicer if you're having a good conversation with one other person and a third party comes and you haven't gotten attached and you go, hey, join us. There's actually a lot more air in that conversation. It's a lot healthier a conversation for you. Of course it is for this third party who didn't get frozen out, right? But for you it's nicer because attachment didn't take it over. Yeah. So if you would be the person who's frozen out, how do you handle that? Um, cry. No. <laughs> no. If you're the person that gets frozen out. I think it's if you know what it's like to be the freezer, then when you get frozen out, you don't take it so personally. You realize that the two people got into this little attachment thing that is a bit creepy and unfortunate and is not going to end well. Leave them to it. <laughs> Yeah, if you're the third party getting frozen out. Like, you can feel left out, you can feel sad, but actually, do you want to be a part of whatever mess is happening there? You're like, all right, good luck. <laughs> yeah. So the next question, yeah. how do I explain that for my son? Yeah, yeah, when kids are like excluding another yeah. kid from play and stuff. And that's where it's tricky, isn't it? Because as, as parents, you, you know, and as adults with children, you want to help them uh, not be so self-centered, right? And to say, let so-and-so play with you. And, well, you know, then the, the cool kids are like, I don't want to play with them, but mom made me, so I have to, you know, right? The classic tale. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing, but if you can help them understand that even if it's personal, it's not personal. You know, even if it feels like they're excluding you, what's actually happening is they've become obsessed with each other. It's nothing to do with you. Yeah, they've got, they have some history, they have something in common, and they've gotten just so focused on each other they didn't notice you. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that you're not worthy of notice. It doesn't mean that you're not worthy. It just means they got into this little weird thing that they're in. And it'll end eventually. Yeah, be patient. Yeah, be patient. Do fun things by yourself. I mean, it's that same classic thing of by myself alone, I'm going to go play with my cars. <laughs> you know, I'm going to play with cars, whether you want to play with me or not. You're playing with your cars, and then people are like, ooh, cars, let's play with your cars. You know, I mean, whether you're a tiny child or a teenager or an adult or someone in aged care, wherever you are in life, people are attracted to confidence and repelled by neediness. Yeah? And that's not to say that when people are needy that they are not deserving of our compassion and our love, or that when we're needy, we're not deserving of compassion and love. But neediness is a state of attachment, and it is a bottomless pit that even if you do get included, it probably won't feel like enough if you're coming from that place of hunger. Doesn't matter how old you are. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, helping, helping kids be content by themselves, they might attract more friends. But even if they don't, they'll learn how to be happy by themselves. And then the other piece of even when it seems personal, it's not. Even when it seems personally directed at you, sometimes it's really not about us. People have gotten into a thing with each other. It happens all the time. Yeah, they become in love with each other's ideas or they become in love with how it looks like to be friends with one another or something, some sort of weird thing has happened and sometimes you have to just let it play out and run out of gas and just be there happy, content. And then when it runs out of gas, they turn towards you and go, hey, you're cool this whole time. I didn't notice how cool you were, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it, I mean, it's hard. Nobody likes to be isolated. But to just kind of notice that needy place in us is attachment is what it is. That hungry place, that sad, lonely place that can happen, it is attachment. 
and it will not achieve what it wants, even if it got what it wanted. If it got everything it wanted, it still wouldn't feel satisfying. Yeah? Like, uh, I don't know if, if you've ever had a, a grandmother or a parent that really just wants you to call. Please just call. Just call once a week. Just check in with me. Just, just, just. Even if you do that, it's not enough, is it? Because they're coming from need. Which is totally different than, um, I love you and hanging out with you is fun, so when, it, when you have time and energy, give me a call and let me share your life with you a little bit. It's a different sort of thing. Then you never call, <laughs> right? Yeah. So how do you deal with that in your life? Because I, I feel like I have a few people around me who are suffering a lot. From neediness. And they need me a lot. And yeah. I have this kind of double feeling that this person, I mean, they have to, I, I don't feel like I, I don't like to call to her just because I have to, or, you know, I don't want to be in contact every day. Mm. It's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and what was the part of you that allowed the dynamic to begin? That kind of liked to be the savior, you know? Because sometimes we like to be the savior. But I don't think so. I think yeah. it's because I've been available. Yeah, and then they take you for granted a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And you know, I mean, what would they say in like uh, um, people who have relatives who have addiction? Yeah. Do you have these programs here, like Al-Anon? Yes. So I mean, really, a lot of. Uh, a lot of addiction philosophy is very applicable to negative states of mind philosophy, which is detach with love, right? That's what they would say in these uh, Al-Anon meetings, right? So um, if your partner is an alcoholic or if your um, sister has drug abuse issues, one of these support groups um, where you learn how to not be an enabler, <laughs> right, to say, this amount of time, this amount of energy is what is appropriate and what I have to offer. And no matter what I offer, you will always ask just a little bit more, because that's the nature of that headspace. To be able to say, this is how much I have to offer, and I love you and I'm going. And you can be mad at me, and I'll still be here when you recover from being mad at me, but they might get mad at you. So do you mean that this need an addiction. Yeah, it is a small form of the same basic thing. Yeah, and so it's okay to say, sorry, that's all I have today. Or I will call you on Tuesdays, but not every day. So Boundaries. I don't have to even say that. I think, you know, I, I find I don't have to excuse myself. Yeah. Because I shouldn't have to feel guilty. But when you talk to this person, this person is saying, like, you know, my friends, they only call me when they're yeah. sad and not when they're happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just like, I mean, what you're saying makes sense from the perspective of the world, like you shouldn't have to feel this way, you shouldn't have to feel ob obligated, you know, why do you have to explain yourself? This is, you know, worldly wisdom. Um, from the Dharma perspective, it's like, yes, and they are suffering, mm -hmm. so what can we do to communicate? Yeah, not just ghost, not just fade away, not just disappear from their life without explanation. No, you don't owe them an explanation, but it's nice if you could and say, darling, I actually only have this amount of time. We can totally talk tomorrow, but I have to go and then go. Don't let them hook you, <laughs> you know, don't let them hook you. I'm going to go now. And you, you know, just consistency starts to change the dynamic. Consistency changes the dynamic, but part of it is that we feel guilty and resentful, which will mean that at some point, rather than gently withdrawing with love, we will slam the door in their face and say, don't talk to me ever again. Mm -hmm. We will let it build up to that point where we're so resentful we can't bear to be around them at all, let alone in a boundaried way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you, you know, yes, of course, you don't have to explain yourself, but it's kind to. Yeah. It's kind to, and uh, still hold that boundary strongly. Yeah. Because you know that it will never be enough when people are in that space. So there is no need for you to feel guilty about not fulfilling their needs, because one, it's not your job, and two, it wouldn't work. And yeah. the thing is, I, oh, I actually have thought about it as I'm actually enabling her, because she's mm. talking about this worry and this fear. And yeah. I, 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 it's a bit difficult to say, Stop thinking like that. Yeah. Choice, yeah. Positive. I mean, you can say it once or twice, but yeah. after some time, you know. They're not listening, right? No. 
I mean, you know, it's just it's some basic, basic psychology 101, right? You let them say the whole problem once, but as soon as they start to repeat themselves, say, all right, darling, well, let's talk later, click, <laughs> right? You let, it, let them say the whole thing once, you know, that's kind, that's a good friend, but as soon as they start to repeat themselves, you know how people who go on and on, then they'll come back to the same story they started with, but with more detail. You didn't understand how bad it was the first time I explained it, so now here's more detail, right? And, uh, and more about my past conditioning about why this is especially tragic, and do you remember that one time that was like this time, right? So as soon as you hear them start to repeat themselves, that's when you, you know, can say the boundary of, darling, that really does sound really rough and you know I love you to bits and I'm gonna have to go yeah and you only give people advice when they are open and asking for advice the rest of the time you just love them yeah love them and then let it go it's hard right because we do get this tug of guilt yeah or this tug of wanting to be the savior because sometimes that's pride right the pride that thinks I do know the answer here if I can just communicate it clearly I'll be able to save them yeah, if I can just get through to them, then they'll be fine, right? It's pride, right, that thinks that you could do that. Yeah, so sometimes you have to go, well, not today, evidently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cup of tea, sandwich, <laughs> hug. All right, well, anyway, <laughs> see you tomorrow. Yeah, uh, boundaries are difficult. Boundaries are difficult, but to know that... Um, also, if we don't stop and set boundaries, you're not using this power of relinquishment to rest when rest is needed. Yeah, and that things, you know, very, you know, skillful, practical things like having do not disturb on your phone from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. is okay. Yeah, then people are annoyed at first and then they get used to it. Yeah? I'm gonna think, I don't know, it's helpful, but sometimes maybe could try to do some other activity. Yeah. Talking on the phone, but doing things together can be helpful. Yeah. But of course you need to find an activity that doesn't yeah. to speak, like yeah. talk a lot. Yeah. So We're going to jog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yes, it's yeah. a way of maybe trying a person to get hooked from the Yeah. You're quite right, because sometimes, you know, there's a way to help them that isn't talking, that is maybe they just need to spend some time with a kind person, and for it to be also fulfilling for you, it needs to not be talking also, <laughs> and so let's go take a tango class, you know, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you know, and you, you, you create your own creative solutions here, but to realize that it's not their fault that you're tired talking to them, it's not their fault, but they will keep doing the thing that is a condition for your tiredness until you say stop, you know? So you have to be able to be strong enough to say I have to go, yeah, yeah. Every time I come to a routine retreat with you, the words I find challenging yet very profound are the independent arising or dependent arising or realizing each of us has our mm. own Condition parts that we bring to this yeah. world, right? And yeah. as a human, for me to be able to continue trying to appreciate that in each person, that's the biggest but most beautiful lesson, mm. I think. Uh, and so every time I come back to that, it's like, oh yes, great, oh, yeah. I can see <laughs> someone just that little bit more. Yeah. Yeah? And it's such a huge lesson, it's not easy by any means. And at first, I couldn't even understand the wording of it. Yeah. Right? Dependent arising, what I'm does like, that mean? Yeah. And I yeah. Think someone explain now you're going yeah. to read it more this weekend again, and it's like, uh-huh. It's yep. really just acceptance, right? Yeah. 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 Acceptance based on logic. Right. Yeah, rather than acceptance based on forcing something. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, just just sit with it a little bit, and then we'll, we'll do some meditation and some recap um, after the break. So just a 20-minute break. Is that enough time? And then we'll have our last session? Yeah. Okay. What we're going to do is just a short meditation um, to try and really uh, make personal these last two. So it'll be a little bit more of a reflection than a meditation. Um, but we're going to start with just five minutes of breathing meditation again to just let things digest in the background to gently focus the mind. Okay, <clears throat> so nice straight back.
and thinking again in order to develop my potential so I can be of greatest benefit to all living beings, I'm going to meditate. And when you notice yourself slipping into a train of thought, gently disengage, not feeding, not suppressing, just returning to the breath. And when your focus floats away, just consciously bring it back, like coming home. Land your attention on the breath.
And now just ask yourself, what are the things that make me have real consistent joy? Ways of thinking and ways of being where happiness is present. It doesn't have to involve any dramatic activity. Just what ways of thinking and what ways of being bring joy in your life. Maybe involving connection, maybe involving purpose, maybe involving benefit. Many ways to joy, but just try and remember when you've had that deep contentment, what ways of thinking and being were present. Just explain that to yourself. Revisit that wisdom. And then based on the things we've been talking about this weekend, based on your own logic and life experience, for you, what is the best way to rest that is honestly restful so that you become rejuvenated and able to continue to do what you love? So just thinking about not entertainment, not things that actually stimulate or wind you up. What are the truly restful ways that you can connect with in your life in order to continue work that you love? Maybe it's soothing and restful to do something physical if you've been in your head all day. And maybe if you've been doing physical things all day, going to your head. Maybe it's simple pleasures like being with nature or unfrenzied cleaning the house or fixing. Maybe it's sleep itself. But just gently check what are the truly restful things that can make you recover well enough to continue.
and through all the energy we put into these thoughts this weekend, may we achieve the perfection of joyous effort, the kind of energy that is well-paced and well-motivated with compassion and wisdom, bringing happiness to ourselves and others. developing our potential fully in order to be of greatest benefit to all. So you can relax your attention. And I think just to, to wrap up, if we um, check in with what are the main takeaways from this course, the main changes in your thinking that you think, I really want to emphasize that. You know, we talked about many different things. Some of it hits straight to the point for you and some of it was more abstract. So let's just sit for a second and think, what is the main thing I want to remember from this course in terms of my daily life? Yeah, so whether you uh, write it down or repeat it in your head, just take a minute. What's the main thing? The main thing you want to remember. And does anyone feel comfortable sharing what that is? Yeah, the right question is now in this direction, but it will be a long way. Uh, but I want to ask her about something. Because just now, this poetry situation in Sweden starts to be more and more difficult because of this bigger, bigger polarization yeah. between two groups. Yeah. And, this, uh, and two groups. And, and start to be more and more hate. Mm -hmm. between them and we know how it was in history with Hitler and we know how it is in another country just now so uh, and this polarization uh, is more nearly and nearly you so I am afraid there's come time what I will be uh, what I must take some part mm. I don't want to do it yeah and uh, my question is how I can benefit to another to another people uh, like Buddhist like um, when I have all this practice. Yeah. Have. How can you help? <laughs> yeah. More peace and more heart. Yeah. Do well, uh, the first thing is to manage your own aggression, right? The first step is always to start with yourself. Um, for those of you that might not have heard her question, it was about noticing that Sweden and I think the world in general is becoming very polarized. There's kind of two sides and the potential for conflict and violence is there and how can we, how can we actually help. And there are a lot of ideas from a lot of perspectives. Some of them are useful, some of them aren't. Um, that we have to kind of look at case by case. But we have to start with managing our own aggression because even if we don't express it verbally, alienating ourselves towards the other side is part of the problem. Whoever we define as the other side, right? This is part of the issue, is feeling like whatever the other side is is somehow fundamentally different than ourselves, forgetting that whoever that other side is wants happiness and doesn't want to suffer and has a series of life experiences dictating their actions now and it seems perfectly reasonable to them, just as ours do to us. And so if we are coming from a combative place, from an aggressive place, they're not going to listen to us, right? People don't listen when they feel disrespected, when they don't feel like there's a human connection. And it could be that we're wrong. <laughs> Imagine 
Yeah, probably not about things like racism, right? Probably racism is a bad idea, right? Probably homophobia is bad. Probably destroying the environment is not a great idea. There's some things that probably uh, we're right. <laughs> but there could be some details that we don't understand. There could be some elements that we could learn from the other side. And then there are all sorts of other ways of looking at the political schema that we actually might be wrong about. All sorts of little details that we have about, I don't know, po policy, that actually we had a mistaken idea, but we will never know that if we assume we're right. And assuming our, we are right means the other side will assume they're right even more strongly and no communication happens that way. When there is threat of violence, when there is threat of active harm, you do need strength in your convictions. But remember that strength and aggression are not the same thing, right? We've said this again and again in the course. Strength and aggression are not the same thing. So you can hold very steady to, I will do what I can to prevent harm. I will do what I can to protect vulnerable people, vulnerable situations, vulnerable creatures. And that does not mean a wish to harm those harmers, or a wish to make them look stupid or shame them. Yeah, because that always has a backlash. Always it has a backlash. So how do we appeal to each other's humanity? These are questions that start with, how do you appeal to the humanity of those people you're related to that you don't agree with, <laughs> right? Because this is how change happens, our conversations heart to heart, you know. Um, and it's so, sort of nice if you have relatives or friends who disagree with you, because you, you have a basis of respect and love. And because of that, you might listen longer than if it was a total stranger. And they might listen longer, you know. And we, it's so easy to write off certain sides of our family because they don't have the same politics as us or same beliefs as us. But from a Buddhist perspective, if you share a bloodline, there is a strong karmic connection. If you keep bumping into each other as friends or in similar friend groups, there's a strong karmic connection. So you probably won't be able to escape them forever. You might as well deal with your stuff now. Yeah? So, you know, what we actually do about this polarization, we have to look at our inner polarization first. Because if we're coming from an agitated mind, we increase the agitation. Yeah, I, you know, I know you probably all want a more concrete answer than that, but these aren't concrete questions, you know. But we know that starting internally is the best thing. And re-clarifying what is your motivation, checking, is your ego involved? These are always important things. Do you know what I mean? What is your follow-up question on your face? <laughs> Yeah, I know. And you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, easier said than done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple question, simple answer. Yeah, but it's the cliche for a reason. Yeah, it, it's, you can feel the hardness in you when you disagree often. Can you just disagree without a hard feeling? Yeah, I mean, what if it's someone who really has beliefs that are very harmful, very actively damaging, really obvious to many people, this is not good. How can you still talk to them on a human level? This is a good experiment for yourself to challenge yourself as, you know, a warrior of bodhisattva values. How can I meet such a confused mind with kindness, but strength? You know, it's a, it's a good challenge to decide not to be offended when they're being offensive. Yeah, there is a, a, a quote from uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of our first ladies, who she said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Yeah, when people are being offensive, we sort of feel like we have to be offended or else they won't know what they said was bad, <laughs> right? Or if people are badly behaved, you know, that the only way through to them is to subdue them or to punish them, forgetting that bad behavior is born from suffering, born from ignorance, all these things. Yeah, it just, it takes more work. It takes more long view. It takes more patience to do the right way with communication. But it does last longer, too. Yeah, if we just subdue those we disagree with, they eventually recover and become aggressors again. 
Middle East, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so remember history in the right way. Yeah. Just gently, gently, right? We're not going to be perfect. We're still going to be annoyed and offended by those we disagree with. But to, to know that part of the project of my life is to not become agitated in the face of things that I disagree with or don't understand because that very agitation makes me less creative with my solutions. It clouds the wisdom of my life and my lifetimes. You have so much wisdom already, but can't even hear your own wisdom when you're agitated. When you're agitated, you do animal instinct reactions. Yeah? You do fight, flight, freeze. When you're not agitated, there are more options available to you. Uh, I sometimes when people, like, as a, we call it, everything is a part of the same. This is a conductive. Dependent arising? Uh, yeah, interdependency. Inter or, yeah. Or, uh, there's. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, like, and that's most people have good intentions. They want the life to work. Yeah. And maybe they don't think the same way as I do. They don't use the same tools. Hmm. Um, uh, you said it's not going to work to fight, but yeah. it's just going to fight. Yeah, and sometimes we, um, sometimes people aren't as bad as we think. Yeah. You know, I, I remember um, the recent example in my own life is when I was visiting my hometown. Um, there's one branch of my relatives that is sort of a stereotypical redneck American um, who has like lives in uh, caravans or trailers all in a circle in the woods and has a lot of guns and off-road vehicles. Um, bless them, right? Um, so I have a, a branch of my family, you know, who has kind of unironic mullet haircuts um, and, you know, maybe plaid shirts with the arms cut off and stuff like that. So anyway, bless their hearts, right? I have very good memories of them when I was a kid. We had so much fun playing in the woods and building forts and all sorts of stuff. Um, but their values are not totally the same as my parents <laughs> and um, don't have exactly the same way of looking at the world. And my folks were really afraid that something would happen to me if they, if they heard that I was a Buddhist nun. They thought that maybe they would, um, I don't know, try and kidnap me and take me to reprogrammers or something. Yeah, <laughs> there was a real fear or that maybe there would be um, just, you know, icing them out and they wouldn't have a good relationship. So for years and years and years now, they have been told I am studying abroad. <laughs> right? <laughs> for, for years, right? <laughs> Which is sort of true, <laughs> right? But um, this last visit home, I was at um, the place you go to renew your driver's license. It's called the DMV, right? So where you go to, re I had to renew my driver's license, right? I have a driver's license. Um, so I went and I was looking at this paperwork and I was trying to figure it out. And obviously I stick out in a crowd, right? <laughs> so I'm there looking at the paperwork, trying to figure out which thing I need. And I hear this voice saying, hey, I think I'm related to you. And here comes one of that side of the family, who I haven't seen in almost 20 years. But she recognized me. And uh, she came up and she said, how are you doing? She didn't even comment. There was no comment. It was like, yeah, what? And she, she was just like, how are you doing? How's your grandma? How's your dad? You know, how are the horses? She was so nice, you know. And, um, and she said, oh, I saw pictures of you at this one relative's house. Um, and I knew you were a Buddhist nun. And I thought, huh heck of a deal <laughs> right and then we just had this nice conversation and then I went into the car and I thought wow that was a lot of stress for a lot of years for no reason for no reason we had just assumed she wouldn't understand you know and maybe she doesn't but it doesn't mean she's judging me or mean about it or cares you know but we just had this assumption because they have this hillbilly look you know that naturally they wouldn't have an open mind you know like how arrogant of us you know, I thought it was such a nice teaching, you know, and see this very rough person come towards you saying, hey, I think I'm related to you, <laughs> you know, but it was beautiful, right? And so I think also we need to remember we are just humans, you know, and we all want to feel connection and we all want to feel understood. And so even if we disagree, there's always going to be that under there. And if you're kind of beaming acceptance at people, they're not so scared and not so defensive and you can talk about ideas more gently too. 
And sure, there are actually people out there who actively wish to harm and are cultivating that and are full of greed and all of that. But even them, they think that they're looking after themselves and their people and that somehow it's going to achieve some legacy of their name or some happiness for their little family or something that we can relate to even if we don't agree with totally. You know, so just... The, you know, it's not a rose-colored glasses, sort of American cheesy way of looking at the world, like everyone's just trying to be happy. It's not so superficial, right? Like, feel deeper that it really is true. Everyone just wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. And all of us are a little confused about cause and effect. All of us, you know? Just so, we just gently, gently, yeah. But talk about it amongst yourselves <laughs> after the course about what to do about your political situation, <laughs> you know, and see if you can come up with creative solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, were there were there some pieces about the weekend that you want to make sure you remember that you feel okay with sharing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many things, but if I pick one, I think it's uh, it has calmed me down mm. to have a steady pace. Yeah. Because you know, sometimes I get stressed out by uh, there yeah. is no result. Yeah. In my own, I see, I see them, I don't see the result fast enough in myself. Yeah. Yeah. Pace. So, and then I don't like. Oh, I should maybe go to more talks and even more weekend uh, retreats and. Uh, that's like stressful. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a big funnel, isn't it? Like you have, you know, a funnel where you like have things pouring into a smaller container. So you have this funnel where the top is all full of teachings you've heard, right? And you've heard lots of things and understand lots of things, but then it can only kind of go down in drips to what can actually change you. But that doesn't mean that all of that is lost. It just can only drip down you know, and integrate at a certain speed. And that's totally normal, right? So sometimes the funnel gets too full and there's a backlog and you have to just wait for it to kind of drip down before you can pile more in there, right? Yeah, so slowly, slowly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anything else? Yeah. Uh, for me, I think it's about working on my motivation. Yeah. Because I think that it will help me with everything. I mean, with the obstacles, with the forces or the strength. Think it will help me with yeah, motivation. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. Exactly. Motivation, motivation, motivation. And the repetition. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Repetition. Yep. Any hanging bits before we do our dedication practice? Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, projections, yeah. Uh, uh, um, I get confused, I think, because of the library and another teacher that I have, and that he says that it's about criticism, but there, mm -hmm. is, there is no one who is criticizing, and there is no one who is criticizing. Yep, yeah. They are not contradictory. Yeah, it's the same teaching. Um, when, when, when a teacher says there is no one who is criticizing and no one who is criticized, the rest of the sentence is from their own side, right? So, or from its own side. What is criticism exactly, right? Is it the words? Is it the intention behind the words? Is it the cultural assumptions about those words? Where exactly in the event that felt critical was the criticism? And you find that it's a collection of parts. Who was it that was criticized? Was it your ears that heard the words? Was it your memory that assumes this is bad? Is it this? Is it that? What was it that was criticized? Not one piece on its own. But it feels like something out there harmed something in here and took a wound. When that is an illusion, that's an illusion. But it doesn't mean nothing happened. Something happened, yes? <laughs> You, you projected what you call criticism, yeah. right? Yeah, and who is and what is critical, yeah? Because someone else might have heard it as constructive, 
Someone else might have heard it as pain. Yeah? So it's not criticism from its own side. Do you understand? So you're projecting how you label criticism too. Yeah, it's, a, it's not like a teaching you're going to get suddenly, right? It's a complex concept, the emptiness of inherent existence. But, you know, the, the short way of understanding it is, is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they are dependently arisen. Yeah? How are they dependently arisen? They depend upon parts, upon causes and conditions, upon the mind labeling them for their existence. There is nothing more from the side of the basis creating it. It seems like the basis made its name when in fact the name was attributed on it. Yeah, and so you just keep thinking about it, right? Don't, don't feel like you have to squeeze yourself to understand. Just kind of play with it. Yeah, you say merely labeled by the mind or not by itself. Yeah, many things are happening at once, not just one thing to one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought Sharon insights you gave me, which I thought was nice. Um, so, in the beginning, you used terms like you know the, the network and uh, like being you know we, we tend to see ourselves as separate. Mm -hmm. There's some other synonyms that I like that you use, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was talked about resting. So it's, I think it's easy for me to, you know, if I'm resting, I'm, you know, I'm taking care of myself so then I can, you know, do stuff for beings mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's meaningful. I, I rest so that I can, you know, be a benefit down the road, whatever. But it just struck me that, you know, with the proper motivation, the, the very act of resting, is beneficial. Yeah, benefit. Yes, exactly. So in that very moment of, of resting, it's not like preparing myself to do this great yeah. work later. Yeah, that's resting the is the work. Of, uh, action. Absolutely. Because the, like the, the network or the exactly. moment is, is resting in that moment. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're bringing, bringing rest to the network. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not resting to be able to do the things we feel we should do later, but yeah. just resting for the benefit of everyone in that moment. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that yeah, was a nice. little penny that drops, so thank you for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Okay, so um, shall we do the, the dedications on page four? thinking that myself, the meditator, the act of meditating and studying, and any energy that's created, any outcome that's created, are all dependently arisen. Okay. So thanks, everyone. And good luck. <laughs> thanks for having me. And uh, 
thanks in particular to um, Martin and Kaisa and Anne Marie and Zarina who really looked after me so well and um, really beautiful center and I hope everyone uh, continues to support the center and comes and has beautiful conversations about ideas and benefit so hello. <laughs>